1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 23. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake, the other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another man's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. It is um, increasingly tricky these days to live as a follower of Jesus Christ, a committed follower of Jesus Christ in our cultural context. Uh, as many have said and many have argued, and I tend to agree, we, we increasingly are finding ourselves in a post-Christian culture, a, a, a Christi- a, sort of an after-Christian culture. A um, hundred years ago in America, 75 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, you would have found in, in our culture kind of a common consensus that was shaped by what you might call a Judeo-Christian worldview, a common consensus about, you know, what was right and wrong and what was true and how people should be and what marriage was and all those kinds of things that people sort of agreed on. And and it was shaped by sort of a biblical worldview. People were familiar with the Bible. People went to church on Sunday and they went to or synagogue on Saturday. And even if someone wasn't a professing Christian, they kind of swam and lived in that, that cultural context and that worldview and they were familiar with it. But, but all that is, has been changing in our culture. We're, we're not so much there anymore, and we're increasingly moving away from that. And there's been a number of forces we could talk about that have been a part of that, and, and now's not the time for kind of a full-blown analysis of our culture and its trends spiritually. But, you know, one of those forces is secularization. Through secularization, God and religion have, have been sort of pushed out of our public life together. And so it's been pushed out of school. It's been pushed out of the marketplace and the job. It's being pushed out of political discussion. So there are fewer and fewer public arenas where people feel comfortable bringing God or faith into the equation. Um, another one of those forces has been pluralism. We, we're just becoming more and more exposed to more and more different types of religions and types of worldviews. And so that's just changing kind of the feel of the culture. And we could talk about more forces like that. And and this move to a kind of post-Christian society is faster in some parts of the country than others. Like it's faster in, oh, I don't know, New England. Uh, uh, There was a recent study done by uh, George Barna, and I think it was also co-sponsored by the American Bible Association, where they do this survey of major cities in America, and they try to figure out which cities are the most biblically minded, and they have certain you know, markers for that, and which cities are the least biblically minded. All right? and, and they did their survey again this year. They did 100 cities, and at the very bottom, number 100, the least biblically minded city is Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> Figures, you know. Uh, Providence. Um, number 99, Albany, New York. Number 98, Boston, Massachusetts. And so we, we, we get that. You know, we didn't need Barnett to tell us that because we live here. We understand that. It, it's more of a post-Christian society. Um, my uh, youngest son, probably several years ago, probably was about five, he was uh, over at some acquaintance's house with their five-year-old, and they were 
playing, and, um, and somehow the topic of music came up. I don't know how it came up, but, you know, it was like, what music do you like? Well, what music do you like? And, of course, five-year-olds don't know what they like. They're just parroting whatever they hear in their house. And, you know, you know one boy liked Hannah Montana. Or this was back when she used to be Hannah Montana before she went, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but and my son, you know, my, my youngest son was like, oh, I like, and I forget that he named some Christian artist. And, you know, typical pastor's kid answer. And, um, and, and you know, they're like, who's that? And they're like, well, well that, that, that artist, you know, he sings about God. And the other five-year-old boy looked at his mom and said, who's God? You know, that's where we're at. That's post-Christian. That's a secularized society where even the concept of God is like, huh? Where is that? And so I, I think what that means is, is that as we continue to live our lives in, in our culture, whether you're a student in high school or junior high or whether you're out in the workforce or whether you're, you know, retired or, or wherever, we can't assume that there's a common understanding or even a common knowledge about, you know, God or the Bible or Christianity. We're, we're sort of starting at ground zero in a lot of ways, and I think especially as younger generations are coming up, that's, that's their starting point. And it just kind of is what it is. And so we have to deal with that and face that. The America that we find ourselves in today is less and less like a Norman Rockwell painting. And it's a lot more like the city of Corinth here in 1 Corinthians. It's much more like how Christians have found themselves down through the centuries where they find themselves as a group of believers in a broader society that does not share their beliefs, morals, and outlook on life. And so we, we ha- need to like get there mentally and realize these are the state of affairs in which we find ourselves. And, and I think Corinthians is really helpful because here's Paul. He's writing to Christians in a very Greco-Roman pagan, idol-worshipping city where these Christians don't worship any idols. They really do stand out as a kind of religious and moral minority and and they're not participating in the immorality of the city. And and he's trying to help them deal with all those weird, tricky issues that come up when you're trying to interact in public, but you just are operating from a totally different set of assumptions and beliefs. And, and, And so... They're, they're dealing with one issue in particular, and it's one that if you've been here the last several Sundays, you're familiar with this. Is this your first time here this Sunday? You'll be like, what? But they were, they were dealing with the issue of whether or not Christians should eat meat that has been sacrificed to pagan idols. I know, you, you're all dealing with that this week, I'm, I'm sure. But for those of you who aren't, you know, and that's what this text is all about, Right? Um, because, again, this was a very pagan society. And it's hard for us to get our heads around that, especially in a secular society where religion is being pushed out. But imagine a society where everything was pagan. And it's hard to imagine this, but in an idol-worshipping society, I mean, you know, politics is pagan. You have to worship Caesar because he's a god. And economics are pagan. If you want to work in the trade guild, if you want to work in the local union, there's a union god. And every household had a god. And if you go over to someone's house for dinner, they're worshiping the god of the household. And even the meat that you eat has been sacrificed to different gods. And so here's Christians, like, how, how plugged into this idolatry do, do we have to be? We're just, we're not fitting in. Should we eat meat sacrificed to idols? And so here Paul tries to teach them. And his basic answer that he wants to give us, and it, it, I'm going to argue is, that Christians should engage their culture, but they should do it in a way that remains distinctive as Christian. So engage, but keep your Christian distinctives. All right, let's look at the text. Chapter 10, verse 23. Here Paul, again, is going over this principle he's been hammering home since chapter 8. Everything is permissible. Yeah, that's true. You can eat meat offered to idols. You can do some things as Christians. You're free. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Everyone should not, nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. So yeah, Christians, you you know, you're free to do a lot of things in society, but make sure you're focusing on the good of others. Like, for instance, eating meat offered to idols. Verse 25. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. So one of the ways that Christians would interact with this idolatry is like, okay, so imagine you're going down to uh, Stop and Shop in Corinth. You want to pick up something to throw on the grill because, you know, Super Bowl's on tonight and, uh, or whatever it was, you know, the Super Chariot Bowl or whatever. So you're, you're going down and you're getting some meat and there's a good chance that the meat you were buying at Shaw's or whatever it was, uh, the agora there, had been the leftovers from sacrifices in the temple. That's how the meat often came to the market. Or if you went over to someone's house to watch the, uh, you know, the super chariot bowl and, and they invited you over and you went, there was a good chance that the meat they were offering you to, to eat at that party had been part of the leftovers of a sacrifice to one of the idols. It was that idolatrous everywhere. And so Paul's, Paul says, listen, Christians, if you find yourselves in those situations, just don't ask questions. Don't ask. Just eat. Okay? Don't be like, did this cut of meat come from Zeus's temple? Like, don't ask that. Just eat it. Because you know what? Food is good. It doesn't matter what those pagans think. You know, verse 26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You're free to eat it. And I think that's, that's a helpful principle for as we try to think about how do we engage a, a non-Christian or a post-Christian society. And I think one of the, the first principles we have to have is we need to engage. We need to, you know, buy and purchase and engage and go to people's homes and participate and be a part of the society. Um, you know, one of the temptations that comes when you find yourself as a Christian or any kind of minority belief in a majority belief culture, the, f- the first temptation is to withdraw into your own little enclave. And Christians are often tempted by this. You know, as, as we see the culture shifting away into a different direction, our temptation is to, like, pull back, put up the walls of the fort, man the defenses, dig a moat, put alligators in it, you know, f- form our own little Christian subculture where we, you know, where all of our interactions and all of our lives are with other Christians because the world is going to pot out there. You know, Christians can get in this mentality. And, you know, maybe we should just go up to Maine and buy 100 acres and start a compound and live off the grid and become preppers. You know, first church of the prepper. You know, we can just all get ready for the end of the world as we hunker down because the world's going, you know, going away. Well, maybe not Maine. Like maybe the Caribbean. Like we could buy an island. Like you think, like if we pooled our resources, we could buy an island? I don't know. Maybe that actually is a good idea. Um, but yeah, we, the call here isn't to jump out of society, but it's to engage and to, you know, buy the meat, go to the party if they're invited and you want to go, and just be a part of the society. And that's hard because it's, that gets tricky. It gets messy. It gets gray. You know, that's harder to do. It's uncomfortable. I had someone come up to me after the service, uh, after the first service, and they're like, yeah, you know, we're new to town. We got invited to a cocktail party last night. We went, you know, these are Christians. And it was really hard because, you know, you get in these cocktail parties and, like, everyone's, you know, drinking a lot. (laughs) And so, you you know, you want to participate but not go along with that. And then, you know, and the lady was telling me all the gossip just gossip, 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 gossip. And, you know, so how do you engage but not get sucked into the nonsense? It's really hard where the values are different and, you know, where fellowship looks like that and it doesn't look like how we fellowship as Christians. And so the temptation is to pull back and run away. But the call here is, is to be engaged. You know, Christ told us that we need to be salt and light. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And that means for salt to work, it's got to get pressed into the meat. Salt is a preservative. It keeps the meat from rotting. And, and God has put us here in part to help our society not rot as fast. Right? And we're to be the light of the world. And that means you can't be under a bushel, under a lampshade. You've got to shine out there. So we have to engage. And sometimes that's going to put us in tricky, kind of messy, complex, touchy situations. But this is where Christ is calling us. And, uh, and so go ahead, you know, eat the meat, go buy it, don't ask questions, just engage. I was talking to some members of our church um, a couple weeks ago, and they were telling me how they're trying to engage uh, their friends in their area. They, they live in a little neighborhood uh, where, where people all kind of 
you know, know each other, sort of a, a defined neighborhood. And, uh, and they're like, how do we reach people in our neighborhood? And their first thought was, well, let's start a neighborhood Bible study and invite people. And then they're like, well, maybe that's a big first step. <laughs> maybe they're not quite ready. That's a cool idea, but yeah. So they said, well, okay, well, how about this? How about we'll just invite people over to our house to hang out as friends, and if anyone invites us over, we'll go. We'll say yes. And so that's what they've been doing for the last year, and it's really been helping. You know, people are starting to get to know people, and, and people are appreciating that, and people are stopping by. So I, I wrote them an email this week and said, hey, can I use that story in the sermon? They're like, yeah. Oh, by the way, and here's the latest thing that happened. So they, uh, they're going to go to the Super Bowl tonight over at uh, their, their children's house, uh, but then they got invited by one of the neighbors to come over to their house, to the neighbor's house for the Super Bowl. So they're like, which one do we do? Do we go to the neighbors or do we go to our kids? And the kids have a better TV. So it's like, <sighs> So they decided we're going to go to one party for half of the Super Bowl, then a halftime, miss the halftime show, and then go to, <laughs> go over to the, the, the kids and spend time there with them. Uh, and, and th- those are the kinds of things I, I think we have to do as Christians to be engaging in the culture. But it's not only what e- we each individually do as we go out of the church. It's also the, the, the attitude and the posture we have as we gather here together as a congregation on a Sunday morning. Being a, a, a welcoming and engaging church on Sunday morning as people are coming into the church. Because that's the other thing about a, living in a post-Christian society is not only do we go out, but sometimes people come in. And they're like, you know, I don't know. what This isn't working. I need to look for something different. And they, they come into our fellowship. And we need to be really engaging and welcoming and friendly and, and you know, walk up to people and welcome people. You know, we have a welcome desk out there in, in the back. And that's great. But our primary welcome ministry needs to be right here among who we are as a church. And, and you who are the regular members of this church, your church's primary welcoming ministry so welcome new people. And, and, and you're like, well, I don't know who all the new people are. Like, sure you do. Well, you know who some of them are. And you know how you know who the new people are? Because you regular people, you always sit in the same pews. <laughs> I can close my eyes and you can say the name of a regular person and I can point to where they typically sit in the sanctuary. You know, I do the same thing. I always sit right down here-ish. So that's like, that's like your neighborhood. And when you see someone new in your neighborhood, you know, just go over to them on a Sunday morning and be like, hi, you know, are you new? And they're like, no, I actually started the church 80 years ago. Um, <laughs> but I just go to the other service. Oh, good. So cool. You, you met a founder of the church. But next Sunday, that person is going to be new. And it's just, it's just a way of, again, saying we're here to be salt and light out there, but also together as a congregation for anyone who comes in and we need to be engaging and warm, all for the sake of the gospel, because that's what Christ has put us here. And so, and so be engaging. Because, you know, if you're new, I don't know if there's anyone here who's new today, but you, it, being new in a church is really weird. Like, everyone here who's a regular in this church, sometime this year, you ought to go to a different church, just for, you know, just one Sunday. Come back, but just go for one Sunday, and just try going to a different church. And it's really disorienting. And your nerve endings are up, and you're, like, sensitive to everything, and you're, like, you know, and if someone smiles at you, you feel like it was the friendliest church in the world. And if no one talked to you, you feel like it was the meanest, nastiest church in the world. You're just, like, you know, super sensitive, and you're reading into things. And so, you know, what a difference it makes when we're engaging to people, when we love people, and we tell people, well, we're glad that you're here. So if this is your first Sunday here, let me just say on behalf of the church, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm so glad you're here because we are so fired up in our church about what we found. We found Jesus. And Jesus has totally flipped our worlds upside down. It's ridiculous. You know? I I, I don't know what you think about people around you in church or how you perceive them. But but you, you don't realize this. But you're surrounded in this church. I mean, people all over this church, there's former atheists in this church. And there's former, you know, burned out Catholics and burned out Protestants in our church. And you're surrounded by people who used to be addicts. And you're surrounded by people who used to be drunks. And you're surrounded by people who used to be depressed and suicidal and discouraged. And and you're surrounded by people who've been everywhere in life, divorced and broken and gone through hard times. But we're all here, all these, this weird people with all these backgrounds and issues 
We're all together because we found Christ. And because Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he rose again and he's forgiven us, we have found this new life and this new relationship with the Lord. And so we're here in church not because we're trying to be all religious or anything like that. We're just here because we've met Christ and it changed us. And now we're living. We're trying to live for him in this society that is like, Jesus, what? Hmm? But we want to live for him. So we're glad that you're here. And I just hope that you can engage with that and, and, and find out what Christ means. So let's engage. If someone invites you over, if you're eating meat, don't get all uptight Christians about the grayness of it. And should we do that? Should we do it? Just eat it. Engage. But make sure as you do, you maintain your Christian distinctiveness. All right? Even if that distinctiveness, this is the weird thing, check this out, only resides in the mind of the non-Christian. <laughs> Look at verse 28. If anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake, the other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. So, so now here's another situation. So let's, let's go back into Corinth Let's imagine you're at, you know, Corinth Shaw's or Stop and Shop, and you're ordering that piece of meat, and the guy behind the counter recognizes you, and he knows that you used to be a, a Zeus worshiper, but then you became a Christian. And so he's like, uh, you're one of those Christians, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know that that ribeye was part of a sacrifice to Zeus this morning, right? You know that? You know? And at that point, Paul's saying, you should go, oh, well, do you have one that hasn't been? And, you know, give it back. Or if you're at the party, and there you are, and it's someone, some kid's birthday party, and the father prays at the beginning of the party, oh, Zeus, we just thank you for the blessings of this day, blah, 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 in Zeus's name, amen. And, you know, you don't say anything, you don't pray, you don't say amen, because you're like, well, I don't believe in that, but okay, fine. But then later on in the meal, they, they, you know, they bring over you some ribs or something, and they're like, hey, by the way, this was offered to Zeus. Just say, no thanks. Now, why? Because... The, the unbeliever in that case is not sure whether you should be eating it because you're a Christian. So there's a, there's a question of distinctiveness. And Paul's saying in that circumstance, you need, to, you need to be careful so that you don't hurt your witness to the non-Christian. Make sure that, that you hold on to your Christian distinctiveness and you're sensitive to where that person is at. So, uh, so you know... It could be that this non-Christian who's saying, hey, that meat was offered to an idol, and if you just say, oh, I don't care, <laughs> you know, he could look at you and go, hmm, I guess those Christians are hypocrites. They say idols are bad, but look at them eating idol meat. Huh, bunch of phonies. You wouldn't want that. Or the non-Christian might look at you and say, huh, I guess it's okay to, to worship idols because that Christian's eating meat offered to idols, so I guess I don't have to stop worshiping idols. But whatever it is, Clearly, that guy's conscience is bothered that you as a Christian might be doing something. So if it's bothering him, don't do it. Not because you shouldn't do it. You know, if, 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 the, if, if the guy's like, you know, if you're at a cocktail party and everyone's having a wine and then they look at you and go like, oh, you're one of those Christians, so I suppose I'm not going to give you a glass. You know, then just say, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, whatever. I mean, maybe you wouldn't want one anyway, but just, no, oh, okay, thanks. I, if, if it's something that's tripping that other person up, you have to deny yourself for the good of that other person. This is the tricky stuff of living in a, a non-Christian society. So we need to make sure that our, our, our identity is clear, that we're with Christ, even if that, that issue is not even a real issue, but it's just kind of in someone else's head. And this is Paul's call, is for us to go out of our way to make sure that the gospel is clear for others and that Christ is clear for others. And so th this is what it's like to live in a, a, a post-Christian society. We have to engage. We can't run away. We need to press in, be salt and light. And then we've got to be really sensitive as we do and, and not just kind of live our lives the way we want, but we've got to be careful when we're around people to make sure that the gospel is clear, that no one's getting confused so that they know who Christ is and why he's so important. Well, then after that, look at chapter 10 again, verses 31 to chapter 11, verse 1. Paul wraps up this whole, these verses, not just these verses, but the whole from chapters 8 to 10, for those of you who have been studying with us the last several weeks. This whole section he wraps up with three 
principles. Three instructions. These are kind of summary principles that not only summarize these verses, but the whole section. These, these principles are so good. They're so helpful. You could do a whole sermon just on these three principles. You could do three sermons on these three principles. They're, they're just so big and helpful and important. But we'll just look at them quickly. But these are principles that as we enter into a post-Christian society, and there's so, much, so many gray issues and we don't know what to do, these are principles that can kind of help us steer through all of the tricky situations, the sticky situations in which we find ourselves. As you're trying to figure out, how do I practically put my Christianity into practice in all of those situations in life that are not covered by the Bible, because there's so many things that you know, we find ourselves where there isn't a direct verse telling you what to do or what not to do, how do we figure it out? Here are these principles to help guide us through all these situations. All right, here they are. Three principles, real quick. Number one, principle number one, whatever you do, do it for God's glory. Verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. This is the north star of the Christian life, the glory of God. Our whole purpose as Christians, the whole reason we exist, the whole reason humanity was created is to glorify and treasure God. And so as Christians, when we're lost, when we're confused, we don't know what to do, this is the first question to ask. Am I glorifying God? Hey, you Corinthians, you want to eat that meat offered to idols? You know what? God gave it to you. Be thankful. Glorify God. But if there's an unbeliever who's kind of freaking out, glorify God and don't eat it. (laughs) But whatever, you're just trying to glorify God in that situation. If you're wrestling with temptation as a Christian and you have something that's pulling at you and and you're being tempted away from the Lord, how do you you fight temptation? Well, you say, I'm going to glorify God. And and often glorifying God means just obeying his word even though you don't want to, (laughs) even though the things are pulling at you. But I'm going to glorify God in this situation. Some of us here are going through very difficult times in our lives. Some of us here are really sucking wind this morning, going through a tough time. You know, you've got to fight with praise. That's how we fight through tough times as Christians. When we're going through difficult things, we, we've got to choose to praise the Lord. We've got to choose to worship Him, even when you don't feel like it. You know, prayer is a, praise is a weapon that we have in the battle of the Christian life. And we can choose, because you know what? No matter how you feel today, no matter how lousy or upset or depressed you feel, he is worthy of your worship. And his worthiness of of our worship is not dependent upon how we feel. And so as Christians, we're called to praise. And sometimes you've got to praise him before you feel it. Sometimes you've just got to do it, and then the feelings will follow. But we're called to glorify him and worship him. Someday we're going to get to heaven, and all the struggles are going to be over. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to praise him. We're going to glorify him with nothing held back, with every feeling and mental faculty thrown into the worship of God. And so our whole lives should be about praise. That, that's, you know, as you're trying to find your way through the forest in this life, north on your compass is the glory of God. And just keep trying to follow it. That's where to go. How do you glorify him? You know, change, it's different in certain circumstances. I think I've shared this story before, but um, bear with me if you've heard it. Uh, but but it, it just has stuck with me this year. You know, many of you know that uh, my father passed away in August, and uh, and he was here in the church. He was a member of the church, and and the last year was pretty tough. He got really sick, and you know, many of you saw him. He just was really ill with cancer, and uh, it was hard for him because he was always like super athletic and active. You know, he's like a farmer and an active guy. He's so strong, so robust. And, and so to see him that last year just kind of wasting away, I mean, it was tough. He just was sad to see. But the thing he kept saying, and, and part of the legacy I feel like he's given me, is he kept saying over and over, I want to glorify God no matter what. I want to glorify God no matter what. You can glorify God when you're wasting away. You can glorify God at any time. God calls us to glorify him in all of our circumstances. Let's look at the second principle. Here's one of the ways we glorify him. 
is by doing everything that we can to see other people spiritually built up. Look at verses 32 and 33. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And so one of the great ways that we glorify God is by saying, I want to use my life to help other people know God. You know, one of the great ways to glorify God is to try to get more people to join in the chorus of worship. And so help people who are Christians to grow further in their praise of God, to help people who are not Christians to find out why Jesus is worthy of worship. And, and so we're like, I want to glorify God. And you know what? People aren't singing about Jesus in our culture. Okay, I'm going to try to help people get there. And so Paul was doing everything that he could so that others, whether they were Christians growing or whether they were non-Christians coming to know why Jesus was so worthy. And so Paul said, I'm going to do whatever I can do. And if that means I don't eat meat, whatever. I don't care. Whatever I have to do. And so there's another way to find your way through the gray areas of life. One is always seek to glorify God. And number two, always do what you can so that other people might be helped in their faith, might be helped in in their spiritual growth, whether they know the Lord or not. And that often means that it will take sacrifice and self-denial. And there's the third principle, chapter 11, verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. How do you glorify God and help other people to grow in their knowledge of him? Well, you got to do what Paul did. (laughs) Paul shows us how to do that because he was willing to forego his own rights and his own privileges and his own comforts if it might mean God is glorified and other people come to know Christ. Turn back to chapter 4, would you, 1 Corinthians chapter 4? And here's Paul describing what it's like to be an apostle. Wouldn't it have been cool to be one of the 12 apostles? I don't know. They really showed us what Christ was like, which means they suffered. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. Paul says, for it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well to men. We are fools for Christ, but you're so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we're dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, that's going to happen sometimes in a post-Christian society, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. And so being a Christian means being willing to, to not only engage the culture and be distinctive, but to then just stand in the consequences of that. And if that means being slandered, being rejected, being misunderstood, being pushed aside, we just accept it. Because that's what Paul did. And that's what Christ did. Because Paul doesn't just say, follow my example. He says, what? Follow my example as I follow what? The example of Christ. And so Paul's example of suffering for the gospel is really Jesus' example. You think about Jesus. uh, He's the ultimate example of these principles. He lived for the glory of God in everything that he did. He was all about the glory of God. He is God. (laughs) He is the glory of God. And he always lived for the Father's glory. Throughout his life, he came into this world, and he always was trying to do what would honor the Father. He never turned away. He never disobeyed. Right up to the Garden of Gethsemane, it was always doing the Father's will. Talk about someone who engaged a broken world. He engaged it so much that he became a human being. He engaged it so much, he went places that, that made the religious people feel uncomfortable. Jesus was with the, in the parties with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and all the bad people and all the religious people were like, what are you doing? That's, don't you know who they are? He's like, yeah, I know exactly who they are. That's why I came. It's for them. 
because the physician is coming for the sick. And so Christ came and, and he drew close and yet he never, he, he never failed to call sin, sin and he never failed to be distinctive. And then he was doing it to save people and ultimately he suffered and he died on the cross so that we might be saved. He went to the full extremity of love so that we could be, have our sins forgiven and have a new life in Christ. And he rose again. That's the gospel. So Christ is this ultimate example of somebody who did this, who lived this life. So what does it take to live as a Christian in a post-Christian society? It takes Christians who are really following in Christ's footsteps is what it takes. How do you be a Christian in a post-Christian society? Well, you be a Christian. You act like Christ. You follow him. And that means the glory of God must always be uppermost. That the salvation and spiritual good of others must always be a prime factor in our decision making. And there must be in us a willingness, a willingness to take it on the chin if that's what it means to live that way in our society. And so brothers and sisters, let us follow Paul's example as he followed the example of Christ. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we worship you because you are our everything. Lord, we've tried it all. We've tried hobbies and careers and substances. Lord, we've tried relationships. We've tried money and sex and drugs, and we've tried everything. And Lord, it is all an empty lie. And Jesus, you are life. You are life. And so thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life so that we could be saved and have this new life that's transforming us. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would make us so in love with you that as we go out of these doors into this culture, Lord, that we would put the glory of God first that we would be concerned for the salvation and spiritual good of everyone around us. And Lord, make us willing to suffer if that's what it takes to be different, to look different, to sound different, to have different beliefs and values. Help us to be willing just to stand and, and to endure whatever it is that may come our way. And Lord Jesus, we're just so sick of being 98th. Would you just change this region with the gospel. Oh Lord, would you send a mighty revival on New England? Would you call these people around us, the people we love, the people we care about, to show them that you're risen and that you're alive, that your word is life. Oh God, it's not just another book, it's not just another philosophy, it's life. Help us, Lord, to be, to have, have that happen. So Lord, I just pray, we, we can't, we don't have any programs to make us more faithful. We need your spirit to be poured out in great power upon the south shore. And so, Lord, send a mighty revival. Send a mighty awakening. May it start with us. Help us to be the salt and the light that we're supposed to be. And then, Lord, use us above and beyond everything we have to offer you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.